It's Biz Dev Live. I'm so excited to bring you to the, the amazing Jeff Hurt. Now, I originally met Jeff Hurt uh, many years ago at Event Camp in New York City, and it's an awesome opportunity for me to reconnect with Jeff, but I'm so happy to bring you the strategic thinking, the empowering epiphanies piece of content that he's going to bring to you today. So why should you stay tuned? So you can slow down and you can really do the hard work that's going to engage you with your audience and make sure that people are getting exactly what they need to keep coming back to your doorstep. With that said, we're going to get into our uh, BizDev live theme song and I will be back with you in just a moment. Biz Dev Live, weekdays at 11 Eastern Time. Biz Dev Live, weekdays at 11 Eastern Time. Biz D with C, brought to you by Cameron T. Biz D with C, brought to you by Cameron T. This is business development, not even selling it. This is intelligent. If you watch it, I promise you benefit. Leadership and motivation, empathy and inspiration. Leadership and motivation, empathy and inspiration. Biz Dev Live, weekdays at 11 Eastern Time. Biz Dev Live. Live. Uh, weekdays at 11 Eastern, Eastern Time. Biz D with C. Z. Brought to you by Cameron, Cameron T. T. Biz D with C. Z. Brought to you by Cameron, Cameron T. T. So, I'm going to introduce you to Jeff Hurd, Chief Epiphany Officer, Empowered Epiphanies. He's a noted engagement, learning, strategic, and governance thought leader and consultant. Jeff Hurt is an expert in applying human behavior and neuroscience to customer experiences. After nine years as Executive Vice President of Education and Engagement at Velvet Chainsaw Consulting and more than 20 plus years facilitating high-performing, strategic, future-focused experiences... Hurt is now empowering epiphanies across the globe. Hurt has worked in leadership roles with five associations, five government organizations, and several companies, including Meeting Professionals International, big up to all my MPI folks, and Promotional Products Association International, one of the top 50 shows in the industry. He has received numerous awards, including the 2011 PCMA Educator of the Year, one of BizBash's top 2012 event innovators, MeetingsNet 2014 Changemaker, and one of 2015's top 25 most influential people in the meetings industry by Successful Meetings Magazine. Jeff, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you. Boy, reading that makes me sound old. <laughs> nah, come on, man. Uh, listen, I, I think... Uh, you resided over one of the youngest in terms of forward thinking. You know, I'm, I'm reading your 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 intro here and talking about you know future focused and uh, so ahead of of the time. Um, we're still doing you know meetings in 2019, and people are still planning meetings in 2021 uh, because they're rescheduling. Right that don't have a quarter of the innovations that you were churning out and delivering to audiences as a part of event camp in, was that 2010? It was 2010. You got it. I think we met at MPI, either MPI or PCMA, Cameron. I've, I've definitely uh, been at M MPI events. And then we were at the, um, What's the hotel uh, that we did that event at? In, uh, in what was event camp at? It was at the uh, oh, New York. Right. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it was called the Social Media Hotel. Um, yeah, yeah, it was very cool. Yeah, yeah so we, we actually met online and um, event cross Twitter community. Yeah, and then that led us to want to meet face to face. Yes, indeed. And we did, and, and we yeah. got to, and uh, it was it was a really cool thing. And I've had the pleasure of seeing seeing you speak at multiple events. And it's always something where I'm like, all right, here's somebody I want to listen to, uh, which is not not what I could. I don't say that about everybody. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, it, yeah, I don't want to be one of those people that be like, oh, another, another talking head. Great. Oh, by the way, Cameron, before we get too far, love your theme song. Thank love you very it. much. Hey, you're pretty hip, dude. What happened? 
that's not the guy I remember. I'm teasing. I'm totally teasing. I was like, wow, this is good, Cameron. This is really good. And did you take journalism in college? You didn't, did you? I The only thing that I did take, because my college experience and, and for folks that have followed my channel have heard this story, but I, I chose my college based on following the girl in the red leather pants around. But I did. <laughs> I did at Eugene Lane College at New School University study some creative writing. Uh, but, oh, I, but I, but I was a, a case study in what not to do with your uh, college education. And that's why I've been spending the last 24 years um, designing uh, experiences that empower high school students to better understand their opportunities and get better education. Uh, and we, I actually have another video project that I do called Alumni uh, Connections. Uh, put the, the shameless plug in there that's also found on this uh, YouTube channel uh, at Cameron Toast. So it's um, something well, that I'm extremely you. passionate about. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's back up here a second. I see a movie in your future. I see a book and an autobiography. I oh, it's coming. It's coming. I followed the girl in the red leather pants. There is such a story behind that. And and we know immediately, anybody who knows you knows that that, that just the way you couch and everything. But here's what I, interesting to me is you have a way with the camera. You have a way. You know what to be doing. Now, I did live TV for five years, so I have an excuse. But you know how to talk to the audience in the camera. And I'm like, did he want to do sports? What, what was going on here? Do you want to be a sports? So, so you can you can start promoting me on the road, Jeff, because I am uh, slowly but surely building up to launching a biz dev company. And our first major product is uh, video content and strategy. So a company uh, that, that wants to come and pay uh, fifty to $80,000 for me to produce a video uh, on their YouTube and Facebook stream every single day uh, can have me and, and get on this ride early because the price will not remain the same uh, in the coming years. So we, we know that the, 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 the system to Who's your target market, Cameron? Uh, target market is uh, companies, you know, 15 million to a million uh, that need a, a sharper and they want to build different revenue streams and sponsorship opportunity uh, with their thing. You know, KeyBank is a great example of, of a, a, a perfect brand. You know, they're 22,000 followers on Twitter, but they got 404 subscribers on YouTube. What's going on there? Uh, you know, let me come in and help your attitude or, or at least in part of my pitch, help you out in terms of showing you the, the opportunity that you're missing. So, um, and, and those of you that are watching, I'm asking Cameron some questions because this is what I typically do in my line of work. I'm showing you what I do in my line of work. I'm I like thinking, it. I like it. Do this. Everybody else, go away. You just work on my business. Let's go. Let's go, yeah. Joe. So your target market, you know what it is business-wise and how much money they're bringing in, but who is their target market? That's the I real. Think, I think their target their market, market is the folks that are going to value. So, if, you know, if it's key bank, let's provide financial tips to them every day. If it's a law firm, let's show them um, all the different things that they need to be paying attention to and and understanding. Give them the tips and tricks to um, follow the channel and then understand when it's appropriate to call a lawyer and what a lawyer can actually do for them and how paying those 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 service fees or that retainer actually adds to their bottom line for their company or for uh, their personal brand. So, you know, whenever, whatever business you're in or whatever business model you're going to try to produce, folks that are listening and watching, you want to think about who is your target market and you don't want to say anybody who'll pay. Anybody who'll pay is the wrong answer. Wrong answer. You need to really hone it in to who is this person. You need to identify that target market, kind of a broad category of them, how much money they have, what are their needs. That's the easy one. Their needs are the easy one. You really want to get the winner with them. What are they aspiring to be? What are their aspirations? Because very few people help us have experiences to aspire to become something better than we are today. There's a, there's a, there's a moneymaker right there. So talk to so talk to the audience a little bit. Uh, I want to deliver some 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 high value for folks, you know. And I appreciate for me because it's definitely going to get me thinking too. So we have folks that are developing their businesses. They are um, either with established companies and they are are trying to bring more sales into their company and develop their company up, or 
Uh, we have solopreneurs and that sort of thing that are trying to develop their personal brand and and uh, be able to speak to their customers and speak to their partners uh, in a in a more thoughtful. Uh, way where they can expand upon their business model and bring more value uh, to all of the stakeholders in their organization and who they're selling to. So how should folks be thinking through uh, this idea of service uh, through aspirational belief and all that jazz? So the first thing is, um, you hit something things on the head that I think is critical and it's, you use the word think. You know, I always tell people that when I'm presenting, I'm about the audience. I'm not about me. I'm about helping them. I'm about facilitating a learning experience for them where they walk away changed. And this is why my company is called Empowered Epiphanies because an epiphany is a shift in the way you think. It's, it's more than an aha. An aha is temporary, but it causes the thinking. And if I can't get people to think when I present, I've not done my job. If all they're going to do is sit and listen, I've wasted their time because listening doesn't change anything. But if I can get them to think, same thing applies when you're going to go in and pitch something to a client. The more questions you ask and the more you can get them to think, the more they're going to like you. So it's really about asking the tough questions that you may not have the answers for yet or asking the questions that causes them to go, huh, I hadn't thought about that. So in the 80s, I'm going to show my age here. There was a theme song, things that make you go, hmm, hmm, hmm. And I've always used yeah. that as hmm. Do you remember that song, Cameron? I, I do, and I, I remember Arsenio Hall uh, widely widely using that, yes. Right. And so I've always said, you know, if it makes you go, hmm, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So, you know, and if you don't mind, I'd like to see you, Cameron, because I want to see your reactions as well. I want to see what's going on here. Uh, just, you can, you can, show you me can, you can see me down on the bottom, so I go in and out so we, can, we got the audience uh, changing things up so that they're not just staring at one flat image the whole time. I, and I agree I with also, you. I also try to do this some comments. So I, rather than staring at the side of my head, <laughs> I'd rather them see somebody that's talking to them so you can understand the strategy behind this. So, hey, Cameron, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Time out, time out. This is what you just talked about right there. How did you learn to do that? Who taught you to think about that and to watch what you're doing so the audience knows what they're doing? Who taught you to do that? Me. So, but that didn't come just naturally. You thought about it. You spent time thinking about it. You didn't really produce anything from that, that we don't have something to produce from, but you thought enough about the audience and what the audience needs or want. And so you have a reasoning why, and I, that's one of the things I noticed right off the bat, that you knew what you were doing because your, your computer's over here on, on your right side, right? And yet you know the camera's there in the middle and you know to look like you're talking to me, you've got to turn your head to the left, even though I'm not there. But for the audience watching, they need to see that. That only comes from thinking about it and from experience. I want to back up one other thing you said. You said that, you know, what not to do in college. Where is the big conference, the Festival of Failures? Why have we not had a conference like that yet? Where we celebrate failures because we learn from our failures. It's, it's, a, a, it's a tough marketing piece. <laughs> well, I think that's where the shift needs to happen because we have this belief that if we fail, we can't move up or we can't move forward. Our teachers taught us that and our parents taught us that. That's a wrong thing. Failure is part of the learning process. If you learn from it, then it's a good thing. If you never fail, you never learn. Well, this is the thing, right? So you have this this piece, and I and I talk about this a lot, you know, especially when I'm talking to younger folks that are looking for some advice. And I say, listen, I can teach you a lot more from all of my failures than I can from my successes. I really think that somewhere down the road, we need to start celebrating that. Now, if you fail and you don't get back up and you don't learn from it, then it is a true failure. You know, that's that's the that's the winning side of failure. Right, when if, you, you, if you let it stop you, yeah. So, and you can go back as you need to from screen to screen. I'm, you're fine doing that. I just wanted to see your ass. <laughs> I know what you're doing, so, and they do too so, now. So, so, all about transparency. so, Jeff, talk to me about what you've done, you know, in the conference, situ you know, scenarios to really move past the traditional speaking head, everybody uh, listening. Talk to talk to our folks about some of the strategies that you've used and then if you would continue on and then maybe uh talk to how you can apply that to your personal business sure so you know cameron i come at planning events through the lens of education 
Um, what's, and I'm sorry about my background here. It looks terrible, right? Look, look at these doors. That's what cost this is an old house. And I actually just sold it. So I'm only going to be here a few more days. You can see where there were some repairs going on. Um, and th this would be a thing you don't ever do. Don't ever do this with your background. But I'm doing it. <laughs> this is how I live. So, um, you know, I plan events through the lens of learning. And one of the things my parents taught me at a very young age, and I learned from them, they modeled it, is never get rid of curiosity. And always think about what you're doing and always be curious about everything. And that learning is the key to your future. When you stop learning, you might as well die. What we now know from the fields of neuroscience, cognitive psychology, cognitive biology, and this is where I bring in the research these into the meetings and events world, is that a bored brain equals a dead brain. So if you're providing a customer experience, whether it be an event or any type of customer experience and they're bored, their brain is basically at its dead moment. They're doing nothing. And we want to get people to think. Learning requires thinking. So I plan events, not with the whiz bang smash, although I like technology and I'll bring it in. I see technology as the tool to use, just like a pencil or a pen is a tool to help write. I don't focus on the tool. I help, I help them focus on how they're going to use it to move forward. So events, we talk at people. And through the lens of learning, that's a mistake. Because we now know 100% for sure that 50% uh, whatever an, a person does during a class, let's say a class setting, 50% of that time should then be doing something with the content, not listening, doing something with the content, which means we have to focus on them doing something. The best thing we can do is have people converse about a topic because that's part of the learning process. As they talk it out loud, they hear themselves and they're processing and they're thinking, or they can write it down or they can create something with it. And we don't do that in events. We do delivery of content. Boom, 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 boom. So I've always planned events through this type of lens that if I'm going to have a big general session of 3,000 people or 12,000 people or 30,000 people, how do I break that event up? So it's not a one-way delivery of information, which causes cognitive overload, causes the brain to be overloaded, and they don't remember anything. Or how do I slow it down some so that we get the main message, but then they have time to think about it? And what are they going to do with it? And that's what's really critical. So I'm kind of, if you think about it like this, Mr. Rogers didn't have a lot of production in the, his TV show, but Mr. Rogers has lasted the test of times. Little production, no big whiz, whiz bang, you know, no lights, cameras, action, but he resonated with his audience and his audience's guardians. Yeah, I, I, I mean, when you talk about Mr. Rogers, you, you're talking about immense thought that went into everything, talking about to the specific moment, and it's come up as a meme, but you think about Mr. Rogers in that pool with, who was it? Was it, was it uh, I forget, it was the police officer. I, I can't even remember the name of the character, but the image is staying in my brain because he's there and they're in the pool with their shoes off and the feet. It was a postman. It was during that time, postman. people One didn't want to integrate the pools and everything. So how much thought, when it, and it was such a simple thing, so much thought went into it. And here's another thing too. You know, Mr. Rogers was a Presbyterian minister. And another thing from the faith world, Washing somebody's feet is a sign of humility and that you care for them. Back in the, in the old, old biblical Testament days, and those old vintage writings, when somebody would come into a town, they were greeted by hospitality and people would invite them in the homes. And the first thing they would do is they would wash their feet because they had spent all this time walking. Yep. Around, and it was a, a gesture of love. It was a gesture of commitment and a gesture of you are important to me. And for him to do that back then, you know, that, those images, and he knew what he was doing. Oh, he yeah. Messages to several people, and it was just through an image, and he was talking to kids about it. The kids didn't quite understand. They just saw him, you know, pool and water, but he was washing their feet and giving them time to relax. But what amazing man that, that was. And it goes right back to, th he thought about it. He thought about it. And the other thing is, I'll tell you this much. The more we try to replicate whatever experience we've already done for a customer, and we try to reproduce it over and over and over and over again, the less likelihood it's going to work because it becomes stale. 
And not that we have to be fresh and new every time, but it has to be fresh to the customer. It has to feel something unique and different to it. And there's ways to do that where we can scale it, but we have to be careful because everybody just wants a formula. And you have to think about it. What we now know from the neuroscience field, the less thinking you do, the less healthy your brain is. Think about this. We now know, so I um, am a fan of the University of Texas, the Center for Brain Health, the Brain Performance Institute, and they study the brain. The one organ we know the least about in our body. We know what we need to do to keep our heart healthy. We know what we need to do to keep our lungs healthy. We know what we need to do to keep our muscles working. We know we're supposed to be exercising. We know we're not supposed to eat a lot of salt. We know we have to drink water. Do we do any of that? Depends. We now know that if you're not doing new experiences, if you're not trying new things, if you're not entering new foods, if you're not learning new things, your brain will decay and you will enter early dementia and early Alzheimer's. Mm. The more routine that you do, the more rote that you do, the more your events, the more your experiences are the same in and out and more predictable they are, the more likelihood you're causing your audience to enter into a slow death, early Alzheimer's and dementia. We don't want that. I, I, lo I love that message. I, I had the question in my mind that I was waiting for you to get through it, but this is the perfect sort of segue because I think what you do and what you advocate for, and because people are so used to like the program, we have to have a pull in name brand speaker. We have to have a draw, right? We got to bring some, we got to bring people to the table. We have to have the draw. And then we got to have, people got to be busy. There's got to be something here to bring them in so that, that they know that there's things to do. So we got to pack this schedule and we got to have this speaker and this track and this thing and that, right? So, you know, getting into like solution room style thing, fishbowl, um, you know, knowledge in the room, uh, power of engagement, utilizing you know, all of the, the, the skill and talent in the audience. How do you convince? And I, and I have such respect for you because I know you've been working with associations for years. And I know that's got to be like pounding your head against concrete uh, in a lot of situations. Um, you know, we're, we're, we work with event planning organizations in a lot of cases and event planners are almost the most, you know, resistant to doing some of these these engagement strategies uh because it's not easy um That's how do you convince people to actually move into these models of learning and how do you convince executives in the c-suite um to do this because i think you know hopefully there's going to be some event planners and people that are putting some of these experiences that we'll be doing over the next couple of years um, together. And I, I really want to attend more events where we're doing more of these engagement pieces. So ju just a moment while you simmer on that, uh, David Fletcher, uh, president of uh, young event professional says what we hear, we forget what we do. We remember what we teach. We understand. And I, I thought that's, that's, that's of course, very, very true. Thanks, David. Yeah, absolutely. 100% correct. And um, you know, what I'm talking about here, so thinking about your thinking, how often do you stop and think about your thinking? You know, why did I do that? What caused me to do that? And that didn't work. Why didn't it work? We don't spend time thinking and reflecting on what we're doing. And that's the big miss because that time of reflection is so critical to your future. I am a reflector by nature. My family taught me to think about what I'm doing and not just to do because there's a consequence for every action. And to really step into something and think about the consequences of it and what might come out of it, but then to evaluate it afterwards. And when it comes to conferences, we spend very little time thinking about the event afterwards. We look at the evaluations and if the evaluations say, yeah, I enjoyed it. We're happy. Wrong thing to evaluate. Did uh, they make that, that is what they call. And just so, so event planners and folks that are in any kind of uh, situation, uh, these these surveys, which only the excited people usually answer anyways, are the most um, angry, <laughs> right? Um, these are what we call vanity metrics. Yeah. And those are called smile sheets because we ask the wrong questions on those things. They're smile sheets. Did it make you, how did it make you feel? Were you happy? And most of the time people evaluate them based on, okay, I sat there for an hour and for this hour I was happy. Instead of, 
what are you walking away with and what are you going to put in practice? And we come back six weeks later and say, did you transform anything? I'm about transformational experiences. I want people to have experiences that shift their thinking. Otherwise, they're just going to go back and do what they've always done. Well, they're there for a different reason. They're there not to do what they've always done. They're there because they want to shift their thinking. And so I can tell you the experiences in my life that have been transformational, that changed me. And they're signposts in my, my life. And those are the experiences I want to provide for people. I want to create that and invite them in. Now, it's up to them to do it. I can invite them in. I can design it. But you hit it on the head. It's about less is more. And don't over schedule. Give them time to process. Play with the way the brain naturally does things. This whole thing of pushing information at people, boom, 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 is against the way the brain naturally operates. This is called metacognition, thinking about your thinking. And what I'm an advocate of is that every morning when you get up, you need to be thinking about your thinking. You need to start your day thinking about your thinking. And what are the two big things I'm going to do today that if I get these accomplished today, the two will push my company forward the most. Not the whole checklist of 30 things. I'm going to focus on the two. All those other things, they'll get done. They always do. But we don't spend time thinking about it because we don't see productivity coming from it. Oh, but there is. That 30 minutes, if I can think about it, can yield me thousands of dollars. You do it naturally, Cameron. Most people don't do it. Well, we don't I'll, say, I'll say this. So, so because there's a lot of people and I'm advising people, you know, when you were going through your, your, your sort of beginning and you were saying before we even jumped on, you know, the focus on uh, the cult of productivity, right? So yeah. I yeah. am, I am very much in the camp right now of do, 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 but I think, I think it's really important that you do with strategy. You know, you do spend a little bit of time thinking, you know, hey, I'm running a race. Here's the starting line. Here's the finish line. And because this race is a long race, you know, uh, it's it's a marathon, not a sprint. You know, like right now I'm, I'm working on this YouTube uh, strategy, video strategy, content creation. So I plan on spending the next 365 days producing daily content. And I know that it's going to produce results. Now, I don't know exactly what those results are going to be, but I know that every day that I do it, I am spending a little bit of time thinking about it. And we're building uh, time and looking at the metrics. And we're also looking at what things are working and what things are not working. And we are trying to be uh, strategic in who we are reaching, how we are reaching, and how we are building, even if sometimes the message is more for me than anybody else. I try to provide value, but I'm trying to do things uh, that push my boundaries and get me to do things that I haven't done before. So Cameron, you asked me a question earlier, you know, how do we get people who are just going to resist all this? How, how do we persuade them? So here's what, here's how I do it. I say, you know what? You're following the biology of your brain. The biology of your brain is to resist change. The biology of your brain is to not do anything that's going to be work. Your brain was not built to do work. Your brain was built to keep it alive, to keep the body alive. That's its number one priority. And we have a prehistoric dinosaur brain for a 21st century, and it doesn't work. We have to rethink this. So this whole thing about, well, I don't want to think. I don't want to have to go to a meeting and think. I want to go to a meeting and just listen. But you're not getting any value from listening because you're not going to retain it. I don't care what you think. You're not going to retain it. Come on. How many of you remember the, the sponsor of the last general session you ever attended? Do we really remember the sponsor of the last general session? No. So it's about this thinking. And I say, but here's the thing. What we do know from research is the more you do think, the more healthy your brain becomes and the more your brain gets juiced and the more you like it. So I like to say what your brain likes to do and why you should do the opposite. Follow what your brain likes to do, but why you need to teach yourself to do the opposite. You can drive your brain. Don't let your brain drive you. You should be the driver of your brain. And when I learned that I don't have to listen to my brain, that I don't have to agree with what my brain is saying, because my brain will lie to me, 
I learned I could help audiences understand and I could help the CEO say, hey, you know what? You're really about your brand and your company is about helping people evolve. And we don't give room for edits. We always talk about people's pasts. We rarely talk about their futures. So what are you becoming? Well, you're going to become something new. You're going to continually evolve. You can't do what you've been doing in the past. You have to do something different. That means you've got to think about this and you've got to step into it. So the natural resistance has just been following the biology of the brain. I get it. Then I know how to play into that resistance and show them logically what they should be doing to change it. And the choice is theirs. There are some meeting planners. There are some businesses that don't ever want to change. They just want to make money out of repeating the past and doing the same thing over and over again. Those are not my ideal client. I don't waste my time with them. If there's that much resistance right off the bat, I just say to them, I'm not, I can't work with you. This is not going to be the right fit. I'm not going to be able to help you. If they're open to doing new things, that's where I, I will go. I'll go right into that and I'll talk about that opening they have and their comfort level. What comfort level do you have with trying things differently? I don't know where we got into this mode for conferences, meetings, and events. And an event, a conference, is supposed to be like school. Starts with it, you know, starts with a general session, followed by a break, followed by a breakout, followed by a break, followed by lunch, followed by a breakout, followed by breakout, followed by evening party, rinse, repeat, add in a trade show. They're predictable, but we're following a school model. Well, it's, 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 it's interesting because when all else fails, let money change things, right? So I, I see, you know, like, you know, the, so many of our, our big conference events have been sort of eating the dust because we, we have entered a world where people are busier and there's more virtual options and there's so many events. So some of these events have lost the revenue and what have they moved to? What are, what are, what have the big conferences moved to more one-on-one -on -one meetings? Now those are empowered through a uh, sponsorship model, you know, um, big brands, basically sponsoring planners and that sort of thing. And that conference model or, you know, suppliers sponsoring buyers, but it's a much more engaged uh, model. It's, it's one-on-one -on -one and it's gone completely the other direction. We're not talking about the biggest draw for the conference is, is the draw speaker. No, it's the one-on-one -on -one for both uh, the supplier and the buyer a lot of times because they're looking for these connections. They're looking for these personal relationships and these abilities to bring value to their their employers and their brands. Yeah. And so those, those meetings that they're having, you know, these people are suddenly important again to the brand. And not, not everybody, they have honed in on who their target market is. They know who's spending the most money with them. Yep. And they know they need to keep those people. So they spend time getting to know those people really well, asking lots of questions, and then providing programs, products, and services that will help those people meet their needs, really, uh, get rid of the pain, but also continue to evolve. And that's what our meetings are missing. We forget that our meetings are about people because we think our meetings are about content. Uh-uh. They're about people. And we are hardwired to connect to another human being first before any piece of content. So it's connecting first and then the learning. And so I've just brought all this from the education world into the meetings and events. I didn't realize I was that different until I was already into it. Right. I was like, oh, everybody doesn't do it this way? Well, I didn't <laughs> know there was another way. And when I found it, I'm like, you take last year's schedule and you just replicate it and you just fill it with different speakers? Uh-uh, not doing that. I'm not gonna do that. And it's asking questions of my clients up front. What is your goal? Who's your target market? And what do you want them to feel when they leave? And what do you want them to do when they leave? I start there. I don't start with how many people do you have? How many room nights do you need? How many coffee cups are we going to have to get? How many gallons? I don't start with logistics. Logistics are a rabbit trail. Well, it's, it's and it's interesting because that's the, the conversation. You go back to Pivot Virtual Summit, Liz King. You know, so many people are asking her, um, what is the best platform for virtual meetings. What's like, you know, what's the virtual platform? What's the virtual platform? What's the virtual platform that we should be using? And, um, you know, she's sort of throwing up her hands because she's said it so many times, like 
what is the goal of your meeting? What are you trying to do? Uh, what are you trying to accomplish? Let's figure that out. And then we can figure out the right tools. Right. And there, that's it. You know, and I met both you and Liz at event camp. So I think back to event camp. There's there's some people that were birthed out of that one event camp in New York City that have gone on. But, you know, even back then, I remember Liz asking me some questions like, well, what what tool do you use to plan the event? You know, to schedule and everything. I'm like, wrong, <laughs> question. Get rid of that. wrong question. The question should be asking them what their goals are, who their target market is. And I'm going to tell you this, Cameron. In the 10 years that I did consulting with, with Velvet Chainsaw Consulting, I will tell you that in all those 10 years, because I would go in with a team of people, we would evaluate large events. I spend a lot of time um, taking them apart and looking at them. 90% of those events did not know who their target market was. And maybe they had a target market, but it was the wrong target market. And they were wondering why they were quasi successful. Now, some of them were highly successful, but they still had the wrong target market. And I was stunned to find out these people could not tell you who the target market was. And your target market's going to evolve. As you grow as an event or a customer experience, it's going to evolve as well. <laughs> That's why I, I asked you right for that. I, I enjoy this conversation so much <clears throat> because I see it so much. I, you know, I, as I'm moving into the business development space, you know, I'm, I'm targeting right now on the video strategy because I'm doing it every day. But my my passion is education, uh, teaching people how to do things themselves, then letting them go go and do it. Uh, I think uh, David Fletcher posted a, a funny thing here. If you give a man a fish, he is fed for a day. If you teach a man to fish, there'll be no gigs for fishing teachers, right? So, you know, like my 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 goal is not to be like social media guru uh, because I really feel like and 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 I've heard even social media folks. Uh, they're really good at it, you know, really understand this, that it's better to do this stuff in house. It's just a tool. It's not the way. Um, the way is what you do with your customers already. And then how do you use these tools to enhance the services that you offer? I got off a phone call just before uh, jumping in this BizDev Live, talking to a limo company and just talking about all the different things that they could be offering to their customers to enhance their revenue model because yes, they're a limo company, but why aren't they a designer briefcase company and a uh, ear pod company and a um, designer of travel experience company, media go. company? Um, that's what we can be. And that's the, the audience that you have as a limo company is a, a high-end audience. So, you know, not taking advantage of those people is at one, a loss for you, but two, a loss for them because they are, they want to shop. They want to buy. They want to participate. They want to be a part of the brand. They're waiting for you to reach out and engage them. And we do this with events so much where we have this opportunity to, to now we have you, we have you in house, Jeff, we have you at the event. And now we don't care about you. Have fun. Well, that's where we miss it. You know, Cameron, who is the best marketing and brand for the event? The people. And we, we show them in the large room and we don't let them talk to each other <laughs> we to sit forward and look at the stage. How screwed up is that? Let them talk to each other and actually go a step further. Facilitate that talk. Don't let it be organic come in with a structure with it so that you can help leverage that and you can help guide them into what they should be talking about. That's the real win because the best brand is the people in the audience. So turn those seats so that they're facing each other and the wide of the eyes, they can see each other. And here's the other thing, the smaller the group, the more they learn. So a group of two learns a lot more than a table of 12. Well, this is, I love, so you're, you're familiar with the solution room? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's been, I think the best events of my life and that's with eight people you take, you know, you can have a large group. It's scalable. You can take a conference of thousands. You can put them at rounds just like you do for a lunch for a, you know, special event. You put them at rounds, you put a clock on it. You have each, uh, each of the tables, uh, write down each person, write down their biggest issue. Or if you're, you're focused on a particular thing on that conference, let's say you've got a group of, uh, 
uh, CMOs, chief marketing officers. So what's the biggest challenge on marketing for your organization? Everybody gets up, moves to the, to the, the right. And now somebody else reads that challenge to the audience. And you have a focus group of eight people now working on your biggest challenge. You heard your problem said from somebody else's lips. So you got a new, uh, epiphany or a uh, perception on what, what problem or what uh, challenge uh, is had. And you got a focus group of however many years of experience uh, focused in on that and diving into that. And that's personally helpful to me, personally helpful to you. If you're sitting at that table, a whole group of people is diving in on your issue. How in the world does a talking head from a stage replicate, duplicate that focus group I, I think it's impossible. So here's where, here's where, here's where I would shift this. I have, I have a, um, a different opinion here. And I have a different way of looking at this. Yeah. Uh, I think that what you just talked about, absolutely it works. It, and it gives them a takeaway. They walk away and they, they're satisfied. They're content. They feel happy about it. I would prefer to teach that person different ways to think about their problem, that they come up with the solutions on their own or with somebody else. And they're not dependent upon a group of eight to come up with these solutions. Because we are also a group, a society, not only with a cult of productivity, but a cult of solution providers. Because we always want to solve something. Right. Well, that's the way the brain is built. The brain likes. Well, that's it. why. That's why it's satisfying too. Okay, I'm going to fix your problem. Fix done. Right. Thank right. You. That. What if they're asking the wrong question? Right. What if, what if they're not even asking the right question to start with? We don't know those things, and so it's a lot. That's why I pull way back and say, "Hold on here a second. Maybe you need to live with the question for a while. Well, I thought the interesting thing about that exercise too, and not to say that you can't offer some other things, was then you see what other people's questions are, right? Their challenges, and right. so you get to you get to go through that eight times. Um, you know, for it, it's just something that it does give you a power perspective. So, talking to this thing, how would you teach somebody to write to um, ask the right questions for their business? Let's say. Um, we have somebody uh, that is not really financially profitable. They have a good business model, but they're not really um, making it work on the money and financial end. What are the questions they should be asking? Well, the first question I would ask in, this, in that situation is I would turn to somebody and say, um, what piece of advice do you wish that you would have known if you were my age that you now know? Tell me one thing that you would think about today that had you known back then could have pushed your business forward the fastest. We should be asking those around us questions and listening and just constantly ask questions. The more questions you ask and the more you can get good at asking the right question mm. and the hard questions, not the easy questions. So even the exercise you just talked about, you know, where everybody writes down, what if we started with what question do you have that needs to be solved? Write that down. Now, the next person comes in and says, what other questions could they ask that could deal with the same situation that gives them a new lens on it? You see what T had difference here instead of the solution? So a list of questions that they could look about about their problem that they may go back and go, oh, we were addressing the wrong thing to start with, but we felt we got a solution. That's why the brain likes it because the brain didn't have to work. Everybody else did the work for it. So the brain didn't have to work, which it feels happy about but it doesn't help the brain at all. And it doesn't help them in the long run. It gives them quick answers, gives them the takeaways and they feel content and they'll come back, but they're always going to be looking for that instead of shifting their thinking into, I should be asking better questions. What are those questions I should be asking like you're doing now? So, you know, I will always, whenever I'm with anybody, um, I've had a lot going on in my personal life in the past year and a half, a whole lot. And one of the things I've had to do quickly is in some medical situations with my family, turn to a doctor and say, if this was your mother mm. and she had this disease and she had this illness and the doctor had said X to her, would you take this doctor's advice? Knowing what you know as a doctor, would you tell your mother this? And I, that's an interesting question because it puts the person giving you the advice in a very different situation. And you're going to find out the truth real fast. And they're going to let you know whether they believe what they're talking about. D and David says you know, saying they, they punished uh, Socrates for this approach. So I, I think he's referring to the fact that that's the Socratic method. Right. The Socratic, you know, because we don't, 
we don't live with our questions and we don't question people. I was taught to question authority. You know, I was taught to question everything. And to well, make sure Yeah, I, I think, you know, along those lines, you know, you're talking about the doctor. Would you what would you do with that advice? And I saw a video the other day talking about, you know, you're dealing with somebody that's maybe in your circle, your family, and you know, because we're in the moment right now where a lot of the institutional racism uh, that is prevalent in our society is really being pushed and questioned and uh, rethought about. And instead of saying to somebody, well, I don't agree with that. Uh, I don't believe in that. You're wrong. Saying something along the lines of why, why do you believe that? What really, really, can, can you help me understand that better? What, what, what do you mean by that? Can you help me understand? There's a good question. Can you help me understand that? And here's the thing that I think we're missing in today's world. And I think businesses have got to become better at this. It's empathy. Empathy is understanding what makes them tick and understanding why they feel that way or what their thought process is. You don't have to agree with them, but you have to understand them. And particularly when it comes to customers, you've got to know what makes them tick. And let's go back to the event example we're using. I know that there's people coming to the event that they're just looking for the one takeaway. They're looking for the answer sheet that has eight answers on it. They go back to the office and say, here we go. Here it is. And they're happy with that. That person is not my target market because their, their solution is so small. I'm looking for the person who comes to the event and comes back and says, wow, it shifted my thinking. Boss, I think we're going after the wrong thing. I think we should be doing this, this, and this, and here's why. That's a total shift. That's the people I'm after, but that's in asking the questions. And we have to have empathy and we have to design programs, experiences with less. If it's just about consuming an experience, then we're appealing to dopamine being released in the body and yep. dopamine has its pros and cons, but we're all addicted to it. And we want to appeal to um, a, high, a higher level of neurochemical that's being released that causes people to shift their thinking and makes them feel good, but also bonds and bonds with what they're learning. What do you, what do you think about productivity centered conferences, right? So I, I mean, I, you know, getting into this cult of productivity. So I am definitely in that, right? <laughs> so I, but I, I'm hoping that I'm, I'm going to try to justify my, my reality and justify my way of thinking and, and, uh, self-preservate here. But, uh, I would like to design a conference where attendees come out of that conference having produced a result. Uh, whether that result is uh, producing or creating a book, you know, with, you know, pre-work leading up to it. Part of the conference is unpacking the book, getting that that put together. There's there's time built in for actual writing. So you have white space, but it's designed around, you know, you're going to this place to actually put in time and be on your own and work and then come back together to, again, help unpack and understand how to really connect with people and communicate better and then not only create your book but also promote it and you know do that and then you got the post work post conference if you're putting something together like that how would you design that experience so people are walking away from that having an epiphany having a, a change of thought and you know what you just did is um you you, you gave something very specific and you want them to walk away with producing something. And I need to couch it like this. Conferences are not reality. We take people out of their work world and we force them into a condensed environment in three days and think they can produce something in three days. Now, could you produce a book in three days? Probably not, unless you lock yourself away from everything and everybody and do nothing but writing. So there, there, there comes the challenge right off the bat. Could they walk away with the template? Could they walk away with the steps and the strategy to do it? Yes. But actually writing, maybe an ebook, maybe, maybe, but I I don't want to produce something in just three days and only have three well, days. Uh, well, let's say I got the plan, because I do, right? So, you know, there's pre-work involved. I, I you can't you can't you can't take somebody 
um, that that was not writing a book and then throw them into a three day conference and walk out with a book. So there's there's got to be pre work involved. It's, it's pre work and plus we're gonna that's where you're workshop going. type of conference. But right. let's say let's say we got that sort of we got the plan in place. We got coaches to work with people. We got um, you know the tips, the tools, the strategies to do sort of the hard work and unpacking of the book. But you also want this to be something that's fun and enjoyable and life changing and transformative. So what would you do? Okay, we're we're you know we're a company. We're we're putting people through a training process, whatever, right? Whatever the scenario is, how do you? What are the right questions asked to make sure that that experience is transformative? Well, again, it starts with you know what's what's your goal? What's your big goal here? What do you want people to walk away with? And you you had a very specific one that I think is an interesting one, but I think we still need to look at that. And what do we want them to walk away with have produced? We want them to walk away with a different way to think about a different perspective. And what I will often say is the way you frame something is the way that your mind thinks about it, the way you see it, and you act upon it, think about it, see it, act upon it, and behave. So if we can give people a new frame, a new frame of reference to whatever it is they're working on. So when it comes to customers, if we can help them reframe, let's say I'm brand X, reframe what brand X is in their life. If we can reframe it so that it's just part of a routine of something that they're doing to better themselves or to improve themselves, not only remove a pain, but to improve themselves, then we've got a great model. And what I would do in three days is I would spend those three days helping people come up with metaphors for what they want to write about and ways to look at whatever they're going to write about through different metaphorical images because that gives us the new framing to talk about and see and then think about it and so i think you could do that with a book and what are the metaphorical things what is it you want to do if you're writing a novel then what's the novel about it what are new ways to look at this novel what's the metaphors for it when i talk about events and i i say let's step away from the school model if you can have your event feel like and be like anything else in the world what would it be like I wish my event were like a blank. That's a very simple question, but I'm doing several things at once. I have raised the thinking in the room to a higher level thinking skill instead of just identification of something. I have them working out of their creativity side of the brain. I have them coming up with this language and talking about what they would like this event to be. I wish my event were like the State Fair of Texas. Why would you do that? Because the state fair of Texas, you walk, there's a midway. There's places for them to plug and play for 15 minutes. You can go to a big stage and listen to music. You, you can go watch the contests. You can go and drive a new car. You hear about all the micro experiences in this larger experience. That's designing an event a very different way. We would come with big experiences and then come, what are the micro experiences we want them to have? If it's writing a book, I wonder if I would design an event with my clients saying, let's take them through the various pieces of the novel. Let's take them through the beginning of the novel. Let's have them live out, actually walking to the beginning of the novel, setting up the problem, and then they have to go through the stages of where they're trying to solve this problem in the novel, and then they have to have the climax, and then they have to have the solution. So I would actually design the whole event around that, and that's the model for them writing, and then to use that as the template for their writing. If it's a self-help book, so you see what I would do with the event? I would just design it totally oh, I love different. It. And, I, and I think, you know, for f folks that to sort of visualize what you're talking about, you know, there are certain things that are a part of every process. You know, we're using the book example, but, you know, you can create interactive poster sized, you know, cover workshops. So what would your, your cover look like? Um, what are things that you want people to get out of your book? And you could have, you know, full life kind of things that you could actually physically move around and work in groups um, to show, you know, what you want people to get out of your book. You could do things uh, like work with uh, video folks to actually do live commercials for the things that you're talking about in your books. But these are things that push people beyond their boundaries and things that they're normally comfortable doing in lots of different ways. Uh, gets them thinking and uh, working through the problem in a, in a way that they might not have done it before. We, we got a few minutes left here. And what, I, what I'd like to kind of do, we sort of went backwards. We jumped into a whole bunch of topics, but I always like to sort of get into 
why you're passionate about what you do, uh, why it is that you you are on this path, and then we'll, we'll we'll showcase the the website and all that. But why are you passionate about empowering epiphanies? Why do you like doing this work? Well, so you know, I'm really about helping people transform their lives, and um, just at the very center of who they are, and that whatever it is they're spending their time, which is the resource they have, doing is doing the things that matter the most to them, instead of doing the things that matter the least to them, and I, that's just who I am naturally. I care about people. I, I want to help them become the next person that they can be. And I always say to people, you're good enough now. So empowering epiphanies is not about ahas and getting the light bulb idea. Those are temporary and fleeting. Those are cotton candy fluff. Mine is more about something pivotal to the core of who you are and then shifting it to the next core of who you are. Shifting it and transforming because we need transformational experiences today. We are tired of just the temporary ones that, ah, that felt good. Didn't really learn anything. I was okay for an hour. Entertainment's great. It helps me escape. I want entertainment that has a message to it that causes me to walk out and go, oh, I need to shift what I'm doing. I need to spend time here. So I'm all about aligning who you are at your core, loving what you're doing, passionate about what you're doing, selling it and making money at it. That's awesome. I'm going to showcase, um, I got the, I have the, uh, I'm going to show your showcase, your LinkedIn so people can connect with you. How can yeah. people, how can people best, uh, get in touch with you to, uh, LinkedIn? Yeah, so I, I, I took my website down. I, I, I'm bucking the system here. I go bucking the system again. I had a website up and everything. There was so much personally going on in my life. I took it down. I couldn't spend time on it. I had to focus on my family and friends. I had to. And so get to touch with me through LinkedIn. It's the best way to get in touch with me. My business has been fine. I'm still making money through word of mouth and just using the social media sites that are up there. I, I am still writing today because I use writing to solve my issues. I just haven't been publishing it, but I've been publishing it in places people wouldn't expect it to be published. So I'm still doing that as well. It's just not up on my blog. And let me, I, and, let, and let's talk about some of the, the companies and things that you've done. Um, when last we met, you were with Velvet Chainsaw. So why, why don't we talk about some of the stuff that you've done uh, in the past and then, you know, maybe some stuff you've done the last year. So people, um, so I am a nonprofit association exec, basically. I've grown up in the nonprofit sector. Um, and just because it says nonprofit doesn't mean I didn't want to make money. That's not it at all. I'm a public school teacher by trade. I taught kindergarten for 10 years. Love kindergarten. I'd go back there in a heartbeat if it paid me the money I make today. And I love sitting down in a room of 35-year-olds and learning along with them because there's nothing about that innocence of mind and those questions that they ask that really gets to the core of who I am as a person. So I've done that. I've done a lot of different things. I've shifted because I get bored quickly with work. I get bored doing the same thing over and over again. I am a creator at heart, and I believe all of us are. We're born to create. And if I'm not able to create things, I get bored and move on. So, you know, I can give you some big names. I worked on one of the largest trade shows, events in the in the world, actually. Um, used to have to work with 35,000 people coming to my event in Vegas. And I had to put 12,000 people through education learning experiences that were transformational at any given time. And those... You know, I had the big budgets. I had the big marquee names. I've done all of that. But even working with the big names and the big budgets, it was always about we need to connect with the person who's here. We need to connect with the one because you're going to be sitting in a sea of a thousand people and feel very alone. Yeah. And we want to make sure that doesn't happen. So, you know, I can give you all the big names and all that stuff. Let, let, not- me, say, let me say this to you. I, I really want to. You know, it's been a while since we really got a chance to talk and, and connect, and I'm so glad that we did. Um, I told you I work with this nonprofit, and I'm really on a mission because we are quickly approaching a time that will be very transformational and um, challenging for the nonprofit. Um, and I really need to be in a position. Uh, as a board member, as somebody that's been working for the last 24 years um, to keep this organization going and doing the great work that it's doing. But more importantly, because while we serve one community, the business model is something that I think could be 
when I say business model, but the educational model, uh, it needs a business model. It needs sustainable funding. So that's, that's our big challenge. But I think there is a great opportunity to bring the educational model that we have even we've, we've had one of our alumni who's gone on to become uh, a doctor, uh, has a PhD, um, who's written a case study on the work that we've done in the nonprofit, but we need sustainable funding and we need uh, to get this out in a sustainably funded way so that other schools around New York, around the country, and even around the world uh, can understand, because it, it hits on so many of the themes that we talk about. So our big sort of piece that we do is, and you talk about the power of the attendee. So while we do speak to the students and we do a lot of events that engage the students, we have a uh, career day and lots of things that, you know, are traditional in the sense of we bring experience into the room and um, interactive pieces, college workshops that focus on the resources that college have and not the girl in the red leather pants and not the cafeteria food and that sort of thing. Um, we really focus on the resources and the things that, that really bring value to a student's life. Uh, Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, who I follow all the time and I really respect, you know, he'll flatly say when asked the question, is college the best place for a young person to go to, you know, gain entrance to, to life in the business world and, and get the most bang for the buck? And he'll flatly say no. Now, add context to that conversation, understanding that the great majority of students go to a community college, big college, um, that they're really not motivated uh, and don't really have a good reason to be attending. The answer is absolutely no, and I absolutely agree, even spending the last 24 years providing college and career advice to high school students. That being said, we, we, we're just about like 95% or more on advising students in our high school to go to college. Why? Because we're sending them to places where they're competitive places, where the person in the seat next to them wants to be there and is engaged in their learning. These are potentially um, people that are from other socioeconomic backgrounds, so they're going to better adjust them for the workplace because my students in particular are coming from a socioeconomic background that is not the majority um, in the world. So if you want to go, like many of my students have, into the corporate workplace, understanding how to talk and communicate with white folks is important. And okay, let me ask you a question here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to fast track this a bit. And I think it's going to be what's most critical here. What is the mission of this nonprofit? What is their mission? The mission statement that on the website that's on the website differs from a little bit than the one that's in my head. So I'll give you the one that's in my head because it's easier to say. Okay, do that. We empower opportunity through peer-to-peer -peer engagement. All right. So I believe that that when the nonprofit has the right mission and they're following the right mission, that money follows mission. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that we have to go out and push so hard that it naturally is going to follow. When we're focused on the right mission, the money's going to come along behind it. And so oftentimes in the nonprofits, we get stuck doing all these other little tactical things around us instead of keeping our focus on the main thing, which is the mission. I love the what in your mind, if people can't articulate it themselves in their own language or be able to remember it and say it, then we got a problem with our mission statement. I like what you just said because empowerment through peer-to-peer -peer engagement. Then how do what are, what are the instructions that we need for that? And then everything that you do around it. Quit repeating what everybody's always done at all the other co colleges. Step back and say, what type of experiences should we provide that empower peer-to-peer -peer engagement? And what is needed to empower? I mean, I would go back and de look at that word empowerment. What all does that mean? And what does it contain? Peer-to-peer. -peer. What are we really talking about here? Is there research to back peer to peer? Yes. Well, what is it? I know there is. Yes, you and I both know that. <laughs> and that's what we oh, tell you. Them. mean I don't have to convince you, Jeff? <laughs> so the research is very loud and clear that peer to peer is where it's most at. And we want to do peer learning as part of what learning process is. But at the same time, we also want community knowledge. So we want to capture some of this. Knowledge is built through peer to peer. It's not one-on-one -on -one, because you don't know if you're right or wrong. It's through peer-to-peer. -peer, and there's so much coming out right now about how the brain is juiced by peer-to-peer. -peer. Yeah. Now, the brain doesn't want to think. 
Got some brain wants to conserve those resources just in case it needs it for fight or flight, just in case there's an emergency coming up. We have to engage the brain to get it to think, to let go of the body's resources to get engaged. That's where I would spend my money and my time as, as a board member and helping the organization step back. Don't just be doing another event to be, or micro experience to be doing it because that's what other colleges are doing. Do the right ones. Do the ones that actually are gonna impact the most and move the most forward. Don't do all this other stuff. Again, I think nonprofits spend a lot of time doing a lot of stuff that has a little bit of impact. And we have to think about where is the best use of our resources that we can get that will help our customers, our target market, our students get the most value for their futures. Those are tough questions. They're not easy. But those are the questions I'm you should pull you in. I'm definitely pulling you in to help me work on this because I definitely, I, I have so much invested in time and thought and, I, and I'm really excited to turn it into something that uh, is, is, is going to last and be sustainable where it is right now, but also uh, that other people can take advantage of it because it's, it's utilizing those pieces. Any, any school that has any kind of sports teams, performing arts, all we're doing is student-run organizations taking that providing some guidance and putting some academic elements. You want to be involved in this, maintain a certain GPA and um, be involved in this academic uh, program, which we, I think we have some really great pieces to it that can be utilized wherever you go. So that's, that's cool. Thank you so much for that. Um, again, I'm going to show off the LinkedIn. If you want to get in touch with Jeff, Hurt, you want to make your business or your event a little bit more engaging and actually uh, hit people where their mind is, I suggest you get in touch with this gentleman. Hi. So you can find you, Jeff Hurt, on LinkedIn. Jeff, uh, what's coming up uh, 2020, 2021, uh, where people can catch you? You know, um, well, it's going to be interesting because we all don't know, do we? Everything's changing it so fast and so rapidly. It's a moving landscape for sure. Um, you know, I'm working on some big name events. I'm just going to keep the company's names quiet because I don't want to. I don't want to divulge something that their customers don't know yet. Um, so I, I've been brought in to help redesign some experiences because I'm all about digital and um, redesign the face-to-face -face experience. What can we capture from that and also make it part of a much more integrated experience? Is what we were talking about before. So it's not just an event that happens on the wall but it's part of an integrated experience that they have over a period of a year or two years with this brand. Something that's intentional. Yeah, no, that, that's something that I think people are missing the boat on left and right. You know, they do an event, but there is no, you know, there is no pre, there is no post. And, you know, I think for, you know, in, in some reasons, you know, people just don't know how to do it. You know, I've, I've seen several events where I've personally been involved in the way that they did their pre-work. It was, they sent an email and I, I, you know, I ignored the email. Now, one way to, to say it is you can blame the attendee and say, oh, well, the attendee didn't read the email, so they weren't prepared and, you know, they did it up. But you have to understand how the brain works. You have to understand how people prioritize things. I think we get caught up so much in, oh, they didn't attend. It must not have been appealing an event. How did you market it? How did you make this thing a priority? Just because they didn't attend didn't mean you didn't have a great event. It means that you didn't you didn't make it a priority in somebody's life. Um, and what was your story behind making it a priority? You know, I think people don't do white space events and um, participants. We have to watch. There's a term we have to watch today. Participant driven events because they don't know how to market them. So you know, Cameron, and talking about all the racial inequality that's going on. Yeah, I'm a white man. I'm my primarily. When I was teaching school, I worked in the low socioeconomic neighborhoods. And so I, I didn't live the experience those people had. I saw it firsthand and it just crushed me. And we often say white space because when we're in the art world, when you are designing something for an ad, the white space around the image is what draws the people to that image. And events, we don't create enough space in them to give people time to think or reflect or process or just be. They don't get to live in the moment. They're constantly being pushed into like in a factory model, do more, more, more. That's where we've got to step back and go, wrong way to design this. It's about less pushing on them and more time for them to process this or think about it or think about something else and let the brain do what it naturally does. And so 
you know, what I'm working on is I, I want to, um, I'm not a big chest number when it comes to this kind of stuff because I'm about, I'm going to be behind the scenes helping people from the very beginning create and birth something different. And I've done that with a large event. I've done exactly what you're talking about, taking the large general session room, 3,000 people, and it ends up being three hours long, but it's been where they're working together in small groups of people of two to four on a very specific content, and they're walking away with thinking about that in a different form. So there is a takeaway. And it's just designing experiences differently. What I would leave with the audience is, whatever, whatever you're doing today, when you, if you go anywhere today, you know, with this whole social distancing thing, we, we have very little interaction with other people, but we need to. We need to be in a social bubble of 12 people that we see on a regular basis so we can connect with each other because we're hardwired to connect. Social isolation is the wrong thing to do. We need to still connect. So how do you do that digitally? We've connected today through time and talking and questioning. And that's what we need to do with larger experiences there's nothing and how do you replicate that and how do you scale it it can be scaled i can do it with twelve thousand people in one room i can do it online with twelve thousand people it's just we have to step back it's not about pushing all this stuff it's about designing the experience to allow it to unfold and everybody to chew on it chew the cut on it kind of like um you know chewing gum to reflect on it and when we do that, we're aligning with the way the brain works. That's better for the brain than pushing all this information at the brain because that overloads the brain. Yeah. So we put it in ch smaller chunks and we let God people time to process it. And so, you know, if somebody's wanting to work with me or something like that, call, call me and contact me and we'll have conversations with you to find out are we ideal for each other or not? And I ain't cheap. I'll be honest, I'm not cheap. I know what I'm worth. I, I know what I'll, I'll, I'll charge. And perhaps it's where we separate. What I found is if I don't say that, and I do things for free, I cheapen the whole model. And what we want people to do is really step back and think. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that I'm, you know, my mission and goal with this nonprofit that I'm working with, but also biz dev in general is understanding business models better so that, you know, whether you're talking about a limo company or you're talking about an uh, education company, I would be working with soundbusiness.org today if back in 2000 and 2011, they could afford me, right? right. If there was a sustainable business model, the, the money was was coming in. If, if there was money there, I would be doing education work today and I would be loving it. I would be absolutely loving it. And you know, there's a wider conversation on what we pay our teachers and, and what quality of education that we're getting in this country because of the compensation. You know, why are we compensating, you know, Wall Street executives at, at this level and, and teachers at this level when, um, you know, in terms of productivity and, and what our country would be able to produce uh, if our education system was better in general. But that gets into uh, conversations, everything from systematic uh, racism to to just the the challenges of people understanding the value of education in general across the country. But for for uh, particularly for government work, for nonprofit, for education, for anybody that is in a cause where they are are doing something good, to understand that in order to do something good, you can still be paid well. In fact, you should be paid well to do good work is really important. And it's something that I very much in my lifetime would love um, to, to help be responsible for the transformation in our country and in the world um, to an understanding of a young person that they can make the choice. It is not a... A either it's not a rich and and uh, doing something that really isn't helping humanity or help humanity and be poor. I really want to get to a place where there's really a true choice that I can be wealthy no matter which direction I choose, and hopefully 
our society pushes a little bit more so that if you're doing something that is actually producing something uh, to help other people, that it is incentivized even more. That's, that's, uh, that's an ideal world that I, I think would be a nice world for us all to work towards. Yeah. So, you know, and we're trying to, we're trying to um, solve world peace by taking world life. <laughs> just, just some small goals today, Jeff. Just some small <laughs> goals on BizDev Live. We just want to make the world a completely better place. And you're talking about equity in education. And, you know, for most white people, they have never even thought about equity in education because they happen to be born in the right family, in the right neighborhood, in the right city at the right time. So everything was given to them. They, they don't know. They won, the, they won the lottery. They won yeah, the they lottery at birth. Yes. The way I help people understand equity in education, I go back to this metaphor thing. And what I do when I'm trying to help people understand equity in education, I put them in a classroom and I'll set them in rows. I give everybody a stack of paper and I'll put a trash can up front at the front. And I'll say, OK, folks, I want you to ball up paper and I want you to shoot see how many bags that you can make from wherever you're sitting. And I call time and I have them move forward. Front row goes to the back. And I repeat the process. And I do this three or four times. And then I say, who made the most baskets? Whoever was closest to the trash can made the most baskets. Right. Huh. That's equity in education. Just because of where they were born and what environment they were born in, they may not be closer to the basket. And then people get it. And I said, it's unfortunate that it's that way. So we have to help them and come at this model in a different way. And when we, when, there's a great example that you can use for college students. College. Wow. You know, I don't know where I land about college anymore. I land on learning, period. I believe everybody needs to constantly be learning and learning for life. You never stop learning. Yeah, I don't I don't think I think the the challenge, you know, and this is this is a this is the political challenge of doing good things, right? When you have solutions, there is no one size fits all. Going back to your point earlier about, oh, okay, you know, we're a solution-based society and everybody just wants the silver bullet, which is why education is hard, which is why poverty is hard, which is why racism is hard. There is not a single one size fits all solution to any of these issues. They are complicated. They are nuanced. They are, they are in um, so many different ways tangible pieces of the systems and processes that we have built within our households, communities, cities, towns, or town, cities, states, countries. But you know, Cameron, there are some principles in that process that are evergreen. The principle of becoming a lifelong learner yes. is evergreen, whether it's in college, community college, whether it's in a vocational school or not, or whether it's through, um, you know, a mentor basis, apprenticeship. There's the principle of lifelong learning. That's what we need to embrace. And what? how do we know if we've learned something? And we're really bad judges of learning, which is why we design conferences the way we are, because we went through the model. You sit and get. If you sit and listen, you've learned it. Wrong. You haven't learned a thing. You haven't learned a thing. Unless you've walked out of that room and can actually change what you're doing, you haven't learned anything. I think I think empathy has to be a part of that conversation because I think just you know because I absolutely agree with you you know on that evergreen principle of being a lifelong learner but you can be a, a member of the KKK and be a lifelong learner what what's missing in that is empathy I, I think that, 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 that empathy has to be a part of that that learning structure. So again, I, I, I do believe, you know, it goes back to, you know, there's a nuance and there's a complexity to our systems. You know, if you've been learning the wrong BS your whole life and you're, you're intent on reading books, but not books by somebody of color, not right. books by somebody yeah. of a different experience other than yours, um, you know, we get into these these feedback loops and you're learning. And I, I, I don't know what the semantic is on that in terms of what's what's life learning with empathy. I, I'm not sure exactly how you express that, but it's certainly so, something that I, I, I you know, push towards. So what the research shows, like from um, the University of Texas Dallas Center for Brain Health, 
Brain Performance Institute, research shows from educational professionals <clears throat> is that we're hardwired to connect. I have to know that I'm important to you as a human being first before I can ever learn. That's where we're missing this model. So when it comes down to Maslow's hierarchy, you know, Maslow's hierarchy is we have to have basic needs met before we can get to self-actualization. You know, the pyramid, at the bottom we have to have food, water, and shelter before we can start learning about things and feel like that we are content or have made it. Well, what the research now shows from the University of California and at Berkeley, um, a guy's name will come to me here in a minute. I want to say it's Daniel Levington, I believe it is, is that the primary need that we have that is just as important, if not more important than food, water, and shelter, is the need to connect to another human being. Mm. And that's a basic need. And if that need is not met, first and foremost, you cannot learn. You, it, it's impossible. And so they call it the holding principle. So when babies are born, if a preemie comes forth and is put in an incubator but is never held, is never talked to, is never touched. They grow up disconnected in society and they can't, they can't hold a job, they can't work, they can't do anything because they didn't get the basic needs met. They don't feel they're important. That's interesting. Is there a solution to that? Excuse me? I said, is there a, you know, talk about solution focus, right? Um, is there a fix for that? Yeah, there is. So that means at any conference or event, let's take the meetings world. That means at every conference or event, the, the opening general session should be about the individual. And the opening general session should be about you connecting to the person sitting on your right or your left. And the opening general session should be about the brand telling them how much, how important these people are as people first and foremost for who they are, no matter what color the skin is and for what their lives in general. And they have to feel like they're important to you. Empathy you first. Do that forget everything else. Yeah. And that's the basic need we've missed in this racial inequality. Because we have said that whites are more important than everybody else. Now, I'm a white male coming through a white lens with this, and I can't dare to say that I understand what they've gone through because I haven't lived that. Right. I've never lived that experience. I can only imagine. So I have to listen, and I have to give them the opportunity to talk about it. And that means I have to give up my time to, to let them know how much I connect with them and, and say, I wish it was different. I can't change that but I can change the way I think moving forward and I will do the best. And here's the other question I have for people when they say, I'm not racist. When you're walking in a, in an urban area, let's say it's an urban area of a city and you're walking by yourself and you see a group of young boys of color, darker skin than you walking on the same side of the street as you, do you cross the street to get on the other side to avoid them or not? If you do, that's racism. You just showed you're racing because you're afraid of them. Why are you afraid of them? What well, have they done? Well, so let me let me let me push back on that because if I saw a group of young white men that looked unfriendly, now I understand that more often than not, for a white person, a group of black men is going to look unfriendly. Right. Um, but I I would also walk across the street. So it depends on your personal experiences. I think, you know, when you put the two situations into, you know, you do the scientific approach. So did you cross the street yesterday when it was a white group of boys and now you're crossing the street because it's a black group of boys that gets a little bit more in touch with it. But I understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. And so I'll do it like this. My mother, 84 years old. If she's outside walk, taking a walk in her neighborhood and a group of people of color, doesn't matter what they are, boys or girls, but come walking towards her way, she wants to get involved with that group. She sees them as human beings and she's going to go out and talk to them. And she will get right in the middle of them. If they're rapping, she'll say, help me understand rap. Help me understand what you're doing. I don't that's get what, it. That's awesome. <laughs> and that's the difference. There's an inquisitive curiosity nature. She, and she'll say, I don't get it. And that, that hurts my ears, but I want to understand it. Can you teach me to rap? So well, she's, she's clearly empathetic, and that's—I mean, you know—we're getting into the, into the, you know, something that's beyond the education because you got just the the pieces of society where you got people that are empathetic and you got folks that aren't. Um, I think in our events, that empathy 
first approach to model that behavior, that leadership around that is, is extremely important for, for engaging that and changing that. Well, the whole thing is I have to know that you care for me and connect to me first before I can learn. That's a whole new different piece of a model. Yeah. I, lo I love to see brand. I mean, I, I love, I love that brands are, are getting on board with it now. I, I wish that it didn't take, you know, knees on necks being on camera because, you know, the, to be clear, a lot yeah. of this stuff is happening and it's not on camera and that nobody is responding to. But now suddenly we have a national dialogue because things are in the media and in the camera and now there's a moment for it. I'm hopeful, though, that we will see change and that this this protest movement, this demonstration movement continues on and uh, affects so many things beyond just what corporate messaging and commercials is. I love to see um, some of the the uh, institutional things that are changing. I think it's, um, which is it, Mississippi or the one that just changed their flag? I don't know. I, you know, so I stopped watching the news. Yeah, I, stopped watching I know, I know. It can be, it can be draining. But there's a state that. If anybody's watching, you can you can put it in the comments. You can Google it for me. But uh, there's a state that just took the Confederate battle flag out of their state, and I and I love the conversations on this. I've had conversations with people in my community talking about, well, the statues are history, and da da da. And I'm like, when did we start celebrating losers? When did we start saying that 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 you know? Hitler is, 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 is history and we want monuments of them. You know, when did we start complaining that the folks were pulling down the statues of Saddam Hussein? When did we start complaining that uh, people want to remove um, symbols of, of, you know, it just, it just doesn't make sense. You know, Confederate, you know, monuments were, were uh, put up you know, post civil war by folks that were hanging on. So it's just, it's just such a sad conversation that people are, are are motivated and and engaged to fight for things that it's just like what are you what are you doing what what culture are you celebrating like i just don't i don't even understand and then it, it really does have a, a an impact on our empathy because we don't we just don't understand like you know listen the victors decide what history is so by you supporting this version of history, which isn't even accurate, you know, not in the sense of like, who's important in our society? Are these people important? Is, is Sojourner Truth important or is, or is, you know, Robert E. Lee important? Is, is, you know, you know, some of these, who are we, who are we making heroes? Who are we making uh, the people that we want to look up to and, and be walking past, you know, on a beautiful summer day? Uh, I, I just think it's really important that, you know, we, we have that conversation, so I'm glad we're having it. So, Cameron, right there. That you just hit something on the head that I think has to happen in conferences and events. We don't allow conversations in conferences and events. Yeah. We don't design them so they're conversational conferences. Yeah. We design them so they sit and listen. Somebody talks at them, which is the experience that needs to happen. And what's got to happen, the shift that's got to happen in society today, is that when we do have a large group of people together, they need to spend time talking about how they feel about things and where they see things going. I believe it's in the breaking of bread, sitting around and having a meal together where we have our enemy sit on the other side of us and we share a meal together and we talk with each other and we spend time talking and we take our time with it and because you cannot walk away from that and be, not be transformed. It's impossible if you're having authentic conversations and those are the type of experience that need to happen in large events. Me, me and you, we're headed to Congress tomorrow. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we are kind of missing it because it's all one way and there aren't easy solutions to this. Yeah. I, let me, let me say this and, and then I'll let you have the final word here. Cause we've been on for an hour and a half and uh, I, I want to save some for, for the next time. We talked before about, a failure conference and the importance of understanding, you know, our failures. And I think that there's definitely, I mean, how many keynotes, power five minute presentations of business leaders and um, thought leaders have you watched? And then 10, 15 years, 20 years later, you're looking at those, you know, they, they did not age well. 
They right. did not age well. So, you know, that failure conference, I'm really looking forward to it because I think those are fun kind of lessons to learn and understand. And it really humbles you down because people get on this road like, I know the way. This is the right solution. This is the success. Look at what I did yesterday and how successful it is without any understanding of what tomorrow might bring and what the next piece of the puzzle might be. Um, it's always a developing situation, right? Uh, I really look forward to that conference. I really look forward to you bringing it to us. Jeff, uh, I'll let you have the final word here. So, so our festival of failure, somewhere down the road, it's coming sometime in the future. <laughs> you know, um, The final word is give yourself some grace. Leave room in your life for edits. Leave room for yourself to evolve. And the same thing with everybody else. Don't box everybody else in so quickly that they can't evolve and change. And then give yourself time to think and reflect. And every morning when you're looking at your to-do list, one of the top two things that if you spent time on would move your company, your business, your organization, and your work ahead the furthest. Work on those two. All the rest of them you can do. But only spend 45 minutes on each one of those. And then, then you can do all the rest of your list that you can check off fast. Focus on the main thing to help move your company, your business, and organization forward. Always focus on strategy first, big picture first, before you go to logistics. So there's many of my final words. I love it. I love it. Spend an hour and 30 minutes, 45 minutes each on two of your top, your two top things. Make sure you schedule that in your day. Jeff, Hurt, thank you so much for being here. Say goodbye to everybody. Bye. Thanks, Cameron. Hang on, Jeff. No problem. I didn't mean to get us into that talk. No, you're good. We went right into the racing thing. It's kind of, but you know, I'm also of a belief that if we don't talk about who is. We think at eleven Eastern time. This that line. We think at eleven Eastern time. This D with C. Brought to you by Cameron T. This D with C. Brought to you by Cameron T. This is business development, not even selling it. This is intelligent. If you watch it, I promise you benefit. Leadership and motivation, empathy and inspiration. Leadership and motivation, empathy and inspiration. Biz Dev Live. We things at 11 Eastern Time. Biz Dev Live. We things at 11 Eastern Time. Biz D with C. Brought to you by Cameron T. Biz D with C. Brought to you by Cameron T.